hoppers, locusts, and fish have nothing to do with today's sermon, however. That's going to be a whole new subject. Could you all get a Bible? You all need a Bible. Look around. Because Proverbs is right in the middle of the Bible, and we're going to read the chapter of Proverbs today. Please, look around. There's Bibles in front of you, behind you. Look around. If somebody doesn't have one, it's almost smack dab in the middle is the book of Proverbs. If you're in Psalms, Proverbs is the next one. Or if you have the Bible on your phone, just Google Proverbs 21, and I'm going to be in the NKJV, New King James. Wow. Mary Lou, you want some fish? <laughs> Y'all need fish. Call Clark. She'll bring them. Okay? This year, we decided not to have our traditional VBS. Every other church in town has one. And uh, it's been okay. And uh, But that, I wanted to have some special things for the kids. And we have had our family fun day. We're going to have a, another one, August the 4th. And George is bringing the phone machine. Never heard of that. But sounds like everybody's going to leave here clean, doesn't it? Proverbs 21. There's a wealth of information in the book of Proverbs. If you don't know what to read, if you wake up one day and I need to read the Bible, but I don't know what to read, read the Proverbs. There's 31 chapters, so one for every day of the longest month. So as I was preparing this message on Sunday night, I always start Sunday night on the next one. And I try to have it printed by Monday or Tuesday. So if I say something today that you think I'm picking on you, God just knew you were going to be here. But this, print, this got printed on Monday. Verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. By the way, that's real. The ruler's heart. And you said, what about a ruler like Stalin? Or the horrible things that happened with Hitler. God will get the last word. I'm just telling you. God is able. And this isn't my sermon, but I just pray first verse. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. God is in control. Verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. No, if you're reading this with your husband, you ladies, if y'all happen to be reading Proverbs together, I'm sure you'll punch him and go, boy, ain't that the truth. <laughs> you're always right. But most of us think we're right or we would have changed our mind. But it sometimes seems like, oh man, that's a good idea. Or I believe that. Or, hey, I'm sincere. I'm sincere, so it must be right. But it says every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. God knows your purpose. Now look at verse 30. We're skipping around today, but we're staying in this chapter. Verse 30, <coughs> Proverbs 21. There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for a day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Reading Proverbs is sort of like reading uh, little vignettes out of a book or maybe a devotional book. Sometimes they're interrelated with a couple of verses, but sometimes it's just like it changes subject every time. It just depends on the chapter. Solomon wrote much of the Proverbs, but there were also other writers of the Proverbs. But I want you to notice something in these four verses. I'm, I, I picked out as I was studying this, the word Lord. These four wonderful verses give great teaching. But notice that Lord, in most of your Bibles, is in all caps. And maybe you know this from a former pastor. Maybe I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again because I've never had this crowd together. Uh, and then we will be together again. We're not tickled to have my sister and brother-in-law here. They helped us raise five kids. Literally. They would show up. Woody had to go to Garden Grill in Alabama. 
So when they came to visit us, we had our suitcase by the door. Cindy and I left. And one night they watched five of them, and one was a newborn, and it was a piece of cake, right? <laughs> I can tell you, they've been with us in our greatest times of rejoicing, but they've also been with us in our greatest heartaches. They've been to five weddings with us, with our children, and uh, thank God for family. Just had to throw that in, family, what a, what a blessing. But here's the word Lord. Does your Bible have it in all caps? Raise your hand in this, these four verses, all caps. There's a reason for that. Now, if you have an ESV, it doesn't, it isn't consistent. They didn't do it that way. But in most of our translation, the word Lord is in all caps. It's a translation of a Hebrew word, Yahweh. And it's known as a tetragrammaton. Now, that's a big old word. A tetragrammaton. But Hebrew has no vowels. The ancient Hebrew language had no vowels. How in the world you could talk without vowels? But as they translated <coughs> the scriptures, the vowels were added for clarity and, of course, for easier pronunciation and easier translation into the English. This word appears 6,000 times in the Old Testament. This very word, Yahweh, or Jehovah. It's a sacred title of the Lord. It means he is a completer. He's the creator. He's the ever-present one. The Jews, the scribes, considered this such a sacred word, they wouldn't even pronounce it. And when reading the text, they would replace it with the word Adonai, which means Lord, also, in Hebrew. Now, the Lord in upper and lower case is pronounced Adonai. And here's that word. This is the Hebrew. Hebrew is read from right to left. So that's, in our language, would be Y-H-W-H. -H. And we call that the name Yahweh. And in many Bibles, it would be pronounced Jehovah. But there's three words for Lord in most of our Bibles. The one that we just talked about is the name of the great God, the Creator. The Lord for the lowercase refers to men, but not God. Like you would say, uh, when, Abraham, when Sarah called Abraham Lord. Or if there was a master and a slave, he would speak of his Lord. We would call that Sir. But then we have the word Lord Adonai used for Jesus. I think that's the next slide. Isn't it? Okay, so we've got Lord meaning Sir, like we would say. Or Lord Adonai, which is a great, respectful name for God. But then the Lord Jehovah. I'm on page two now. David used it with, I will praise you, O Lord, among the heathen, among the nations. The Lord Je Yahweh, this transliteration from Hebrew to English, that's how we get Yahweh, the four letters. The tetragrammaton means tetra meaning four, Y-H-W-H. In fact, when they were translating this word, it was such a holy word. The scribes would go wash their hands before writing that name of God. Then, to purify themselves, they would get another portion of ink. Sometimes they would get a new quill. They would wash their entire body. See, the parchments were made from animal skins. It wasn't papyrus. It wasn't paper. It was animal skins. That's how they could be so preserved. And isn't that amazing? <coughs> Through all of that, we carry around a book of 66 books that is a homogeneous book made up of the words of God to us. No word can be written from memory. When the scribes were copying the scripts, they had to have an open scroll in front of them. And if they made a mistake, they would have to start that project completely over. Folks, 
We don't take our Bible seriously enough. I, I shared you with all that so you can understand how awesome it is that we have a copy of the words of God written in Hebrew, Greek, and some Aramaic. And just recently, it was celebrated the death of John Huss. I didn't have it in my notes. Who did we discuss? Tyndale. William Tyndale was burned at the stake for translating the Bible. He said, why wouldn't they want? Because the church at that time wanted all the control. They didn't want all the people to have a Bible. They, or they didn't call it the Bible at that time. They didn't want them to have the, the, the scriptures. Because they wanted to tell them what it meant. They wanted to be the only authority. And when, when uh, John Calvin and the Reformers stood up and said, we must have the Bible, and the first book that was ever printed was the Bible. That is awesome. Don't, don't take your Bible for granted. Love your Bible. Don't leave it in the car all week. You say, well, that's like a church Bible, and I'll leave it in the car. Well, great. You might put it in the window's going to get all curled up. But have a Bible at your house that is precious to you. That is your Bible. That you love. And if you're waiting to come to church every Sunday to get fed like a little bird, you're coming in already starved. You ought to already be fed the Word of God all week long by your own desire. If you have no desire to read the Bible, I think you better check up on your salvation. Because that's God's word. And if you can go for a week and not care about reading the word or listening to something that would help you, you better check up. When you read your Bible, realize how holy the name of God is. Now we're going to go back to the beginning of chapter 21. The first mention of this word Yahweh was in Genesis 2.4. It says, the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. And that, that would be the capital letter, Lord. And then in the third commandment, who tells us what's the third commandment? Don't say the Lord's name in vain. That's right. Honor the name of God. And uh, this is the Ten Commandments and... Alan ordered this little, and this is the original that Moses passed down to Alan. And he got it wrong. I would suggest every home ought to get this. This is in the King James, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. But folks, we whine and complain about the schools. What do you mean the schools? It's not the school's job to teach your children the Word of God. It's your job. <laughs> And that's why we want these children in here learning the Word of God today. But Alan found that and, and uh, brought me a copy of that. And, and if y'all want one, ask Alan to order for it, okay? <laughs> but the third commandment said, Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now let's look at some other things in Proverbs. That was your introduction to the sermon. Let's look at verse 3 in chapter 21. Fill in the words as I read, please, if you have the New King James, and that's what we have in our pews here. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. sacrifice. Now skip down to verse 8. The way of a guilty man is perverse, but as for the pure, his work is right. Verse 10, the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no favor in his eyes. And verse 15, it is a joy for the just to do justice, but destruction will come to the workers of iniquity. Verse 21, he who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness and honor. One theme in the book of Proverbs in this chapter is do right. Just do right. Do the right thing. If you're reading this book with your family, and if 
Kim, I wouldn't expect you to sit down and read a whole chapter of those two children. Yeah, they got children's Bible book. But it would be, I strongly recommend parents and grandparents that they see you hold a Bible because we don't want them to think that the Bible is just stories like The Wizard of Oz or fairy tales or other books that they have from school. And let them see a Bible and let them read a verse out of that book. They've got to grow up knowing this book has something for me. Let them see if you just read one verse and explain that. But one thing you say is, you know what? You did the wrong thing today. And we learned in our Proverbs that you should do the right thing. That's one of the things. Another thing is in verse 4. Pride destroys. Now, there's three verses here that deal with pride. Pride. What's the middle letter in pride? Uh, pride means everything's about me. Pride means I'm always right and you're always wrong. I will never admit I have the answers and I have the final authority. That's pride. And that's what happened when Lucifer, the fallen angel, decided I must, I need to be better than God. Now I don't understand how a created angel had the will to do that. I, I, I don't have that understanding. But the Bible says it happened. And that is why hell was created for the demons. <clears throat> the devil and his demons who rebelled against God. It was pride. Lucifer was lived through the pride. But look at verse 4. A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked are what? Sin. You know how your child can... You, that your child can talk back without saying a word. Watch. I'm sure you've never seen that out of your kids. Or. The old rolling the eyes. You know how they learned to do that? They watched their parents do that. They didn't just learn that at school with bubbles. School with bubbles. <laughs> I'm not being, I'm being very generic here on this one, okay? But neither do I want you to take the Bible and beat your kids over the head with it. Oh, you should do that. The Bible says that's bad. They're going to get the idea that God's no fun. Everything in the world is wrong because of that book. Now, they need to see the love part in this book, too. But it's okay if you say to your child or the person you're dealing with, or maybe your, your co-worker. You know, the Bible says a proud heart is sin. And you're not always right. Verse 24. A proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. pride. Verse 29. A wicked man, what does to his face? Hardness. Be careful. Don't get so discouraged and overwhelmed with the world that you become hardened. A wicked man hardens his face, but it's for the upright he establishes his way. Folks, pride destroys. It'll destroy your home. It'll destroy your, your business. It'll destroy every part of your life because pride says, I, everything must be my way. And that's just not going to happen. <coughs> Pride is so, when you're so self-centered. That's in the Bible. A haughty look. We don't usually use the word haughty. What, what would you say would be a good synonym of haughty? Pride. Yeah, proud, haughty. McDonald's. <coughs> say it again. <laughs> We both have hard here. What you say? No, it's like you're poking fun of somebody that says, hot is, hot is. It's oh, oh this is <laughs> <at> McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and when I make fun of the way y'all talk, it works both ways. I talk funny too. Hot is, it'd be a hot. I just got it. Hot <laughs> <laughs> So pride destroys. 
and say, I was wrong. And not wait on them to say, yeah, I was too. You know, if you apologize, don't leave it hanging like, well, I'm sorry. It's not so you'll say, well, I am too. True repentance or true apology is like, for my part, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. Okay, you may not get, you may have to forgive somebody who never asked you to forgive them. Next point. Hard work is rewarded. Now, I'm sorry Sam's not here today because Jamie said he's the hardest working man in the county. That's what he said. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Look at verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead surely to poverty, but those of everyone who is hasty, surely to poverty. Hard work is rewarded. Be diligent. Work hard. I'm not bragging. I'm just thankful. This morning, my teacher sent me my grades for this past week. I had to submit an 18-page paper that I probably worked on it for 20 hours. It was crazy. And I got a 100 score this morning. And thank you, Lord, and thank you, kind teacher. But, uh, but yeah, thank God for visiting the nursing home so I can study. But it is rewarding when you feel like you've done your best. And someone says, good job. Mom and dad, when's the last time you said to your kids, good job? Maybe they didn't make their bed perfectly, but maybe they tried. Maybe they do better than you do. Woo! Y'all make your bed every day, and that's in the Bible somewhere, okay? <laughs> Verse 25, the desire of a lazy person kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Look, if somebody won't work, don't, I wouldn't feed them. They come to you begging. These people standing on the street that could be out working that just want you to hand it to them, I don't do it. They peck on my window and ask me for, you got enough money for me to go buy some food? I always say, you know, I don't. Because I'm not giving it to people who won't work. The Bible says hard work is to be rewarded. The desire of a lazy man kills him. Next thing. All this is in one little chapter. Today's chapter. I knew when I prepared this, I'd be reading it on the 21st. So I wanted to show you how awesome it is to read the Bible. Now, every chapter doesn't seem to be this relative. But this one sure does. Next point. Be honest. All the time. Now, guys, if, if you're asked the question, do you like this dish? How does it taste to you? I always say, you know I'm not going to tell you anything but good, but go ahead, I'll taste it. Unless it's a raw tomato. <laughs> How does this dress look on me? The answer is, honey, do you like it? Do you like the way it looks on me? Because I do, you know? But sure, seriously, we need to be honest. Your kids don't need to, to be taught how to lie. They might watch you and learn how to lie. Verse 6 says, Getting treasures by a lying tongue is the fleeting fantasy of those who seek death. It's not going to last. You say, I know a lot of dishonest rich people. Just hang on. God's getting the last word. Verse 14, A gift in secret pacifies anger. But a bribe behind the back, strong wrath. Verse 28, a false witness will perish, but the man who hears him well will speak endlessly. A false witness will perish. I know it makes me angry when I see someone, even on you know, the news or whatever, that is you know that is a total lie. But I can't fix that, but I can fix my mouth. I can fix my attitude. And I can be honest. Be honest in my business dealings. Be honest with my family. Love people without reserve. Be honest. 
Next point. Violence is destructive. Look at verse 7. The violence of the wicked will what? Destroy them. Because they refuse to do justice. Some people are just looking for a fight. Look at verse 9. Keep peace at home. This is important. There's two verses in this one passage that speaks of <coughs> dwelling in peace. Verse 9. Better to dwell in the corner of a housetop. And most of us don't have corners of housetops. Okay? You might have an attic. But in this day, they had flat roofs and they could go up on the house top. And maybe you should take a walk and go up on the roof. I don't know. They're in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now, a, a man wrote this. But it works both ways. The Bible is applicable to all genders. If you were a contentious, fussy, constantly complaining person... Your family might be just as well to go live out in the field somewhere. And don't leave the house mad. Don't slam the door. But it might be that you just hold your tongue and go somewhere else for a little while. But seek peace. How can we teach our children to have peace in their homes when they get older if they haven't seen how we deal with it? And folks, it may just be, you know what? You and I are not agreeing on this right now, and we're going to stop this conversation. Peace doesn't mean I agree with you. Peace doesn't mean you're right and I'm wrong all the time. Peace means we're going to stop this discussion. And sometimes that's really healthy. I wish I could learn to do that. <laughs> that's a great Bible verse, though. The other day when I drove the hearse with Craig's grandma and sang to the mother, I said, this is the only time I've gotten the last word with her. <laughs> I was honored to drive that hearse and have Miss Tina. You know you just want you know the Civil War. It's the only big curve that you... <laughs> I don't understand what you just said. I, like you <laughs> <laughs> I think you hit a tombstone when you were going in there. Oh, no. <laughs> I straightened up. I hit a tombstone. Well, they don't pay me a lot to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. That cemetery wasn't made for big cars, for sure. No, it but you don't always have to get the last word. Sometimes you just need to shut up. I'm guilty. It's terrible when you're your wife's pastor. Bless her heart. She doesn't have a preacher she can go talk to. You know? <laughs> Listen to wisdom. Verse 11. I'm almost done. This is so much fun. Verse 11. When the scoffer is punished, the symbol is made what? Wise. wise. Y'all stay with me now. Open that Bible. But when the wise is instructed, he receives knowledge. The wise person listens. Verse 15, a man who wanders from the way of understanding will rest in the assembly of the dead. Listen to wisdom. Someone older than me gave me some advice this week, and I took it, and I thanked him. And by the way, you don't have to be older than me. You give me some good wisdom. Your kids sometimes can help you. They might say, hey, mom, or hey, dad, I'll tell you what I think about this. They may have some wisdom to help you. Next point, God judges sin. There's only one verse in this chapter, but it's good one, verse 12. The righteous God wisely considers the house of the wicked, overthrowing the wicked for their wickedness. You say, how did they get away with that? You just hang on. God judges. Next, help those who are suffering. Now, just a few minutes ago, I said I don't give them dollars in their buckets. But I'm talking about true suffering. Verse 13, whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be heard. But you're not helping anybody who refuses to help 
and do what is right for themselves. Verse 26, he covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. I was first hired as a youth pastor in Roma, Virginia in 1978. This guy came to the church, and we had a gas tank out back that they used for the buses. And I was the pastor of the day that was supposed to get all the nuts and drop by. You know, you took turns when you have a larger staff. And I was so proud that I was, and proud was probably the wrong word, but he said, I'm going, I'm, they're always going to Florida for a, for a funeral, you know. Uh, but he gave a sad story, and he said he didn't have any money. Did we, I said, well, we can't give you any money, but we can fill up your tank with cash. So I, I went out and filled up his tank with cash, and I felt so good about it. Then I went on down the road to Hardy's, and he was ordering a great big meal at Hardy's. <laughs> 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 so I thought, well, he wasn't broke, but but you know what? I did it for a You got I know you helped somebody that turned around and you thought, well, they'd appreciate that. That didn't work. If you did it with the spirit of Christ and that cup of cold water for that person, you've done it for the right reason. And he says, help those who are suffering. By the way, you can't give food to the wrong person. If someone just gave us a lot of groceries yesterday. If you know someone who truly needs some staples, some groceries, you will let Cindy or me know, and we'll help you. Last point. Have self-control. Ah, oh, this is a tough one. Verse 17. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. Now, I've never seen anybody drink oil. <laughs> but don't you drink that whole bottle of olive oil. You know, we're talking about the richness of life. If you are feasting on riches, whether it's money or anything, any kind of substance, or even just the finest foods in the world, if you... If your pleasure is through that, you'll end up poor. Verse 20, there is a desperate, excuse me, there is a desirable treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man squanders it. Oil is a representation also of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. We've had times where we anointed people with oil when they were sick. That's in the Bible. It's scriptural. Matthew, excuse me, James chapter 5.